A two-night special, November 27th and 28th at 8 o'clock Eastern on C-SPAN. Now, a debate between the candidates for New York's U.S. Senate seat. On Friday, Democratic candidate Hillary Rodham Clinton and her opponent, Republican Congressman Rick Lazio, met for the third and final debate. The hour-long event was hosted by WNBC-TV in New York City. Good evening. We welcome our viewers to the third and last New York Senate debate. Welcome also to First Lady Hillary Clinton, the Democratic candidate for the United States Senate in New York, and Congressman Rick Lazio, the Republican candidate for the Senate. We're glad that we can hear about the issues from both of you. This will be an informal discussion. I want you to each have a chance to talk about what you believe and to rebut your opponent's views. At the end of this hour, each of you will have an opportunity for a last word to the voters. I'll try to be fair. The first question, as determined by a coin toss, goes to you, Congressman Lazio. And actually, it's a question that I'm going to also ask about the same question of uh, Hillary Clinton. We live in an age of polls and focus groups. And many people have the impression that candidates are programmed to respond to issues according to what their advisors believe the voters want. Can you give me one example where you have taken an unpopular course despite what your advisors say because you thought it was right? Sure, absolutely. I've done that many times, Gabe, uh, in Congress, uh, supporting NAFTA and the assault weapons ban uh, after receiving thousands and thousands of calls from people who uh, wanted me to go in a different direction because I thought it was the right thing to do. I think it's very important to stand up for your beliefs. So even in this race, I know there are a lot of people who uh, would like to see casino gambling in one of our earlier debates. Uh, I, I expressed my personal opposition to casino gambling. Uh, although I, I believe this in the end is a state decision. Uh, so I think there are many, many times when I have demonstrated independence on a whole range of issues. Uh, in Congress, regularly on issues of public funding for the arts, which I support, on issues of protecting the environment, whether it's anti-environmental uh, actions by Republicans or Democrats. I think it's been very reflective of my record to cross party lines and to show independence and to stand up, even if it's unpopular, either with my party or with the public. Mrs. Clinton, you gave me more than one example. <laughs> what about you? Well, I'll give you two, Gabe. Um, you know, back in 1983, when I was probably the first person in the country who said that we should test teachers, that was extremely unpopular and it caused quite an uproar. But it was the right thing to do, and I still believe today that uh, we should be testing new teachers uh, and raising standards for our teachers. And then in 1995, when I went to China to speak on behalf of women's rights, there were many people uh, inside and outside our own government, people literally around the world, who said I shouldn't go, that I shouldn't make a speech, that I shouldn't criticize the Chinese government. I thought it was the right thing to do then. I'm glad I did it to stand up for American values, and that's what I would try to do in the Senate. Do you think that there's a feeling abroad, a feeling uh, among the people of America, many of them, uh, that there's a lot of pandering going on, that there's kind of weather vane, the weather vane changes in positions? Well, I think that uh, in this presidential year, uh, there are very big differences between the candidates, just as there are in my race. Uh, sometimes those differences may not be as clearly stated or defined as I think they would be in the White House or in the Congress. Um, but for me, looking at this election, uh, I'm struck by what different views uh, my opponent and I have, what different views the two presidential candidates that we support have, everything from how we would use the surplus and protect Social Security and yeah, Medicare that's not to my education. Question. My question is, is there a kind of perception that candidates are weather vanes, that they change according to the polls? Well, there may be. I don't know. I'm, I'm so focused on what I'm trying to do that I'm mostly paying attention to my own race and, and what I believe. And you? Yeah, I, I believe there is. I think that's why there's a lot of cynicism among young people. They think that people, uh, and I think this White House in particular has been known for its extensive use of polling and focus groups and survey data to make decisions. And I think the American people want somebody to lead. They want people to lead. Uh, for example, I think it, it's, it was important when the United Nations Security Council uh, f voted to condemn Israel uh, for the use of force, which I think was an abomination. I think it was wrong for America to sit on the sidelines. 
it, it didn't take me a day to put my finger up in the wind and decide which way public opinion was going. It took me only a couple hours to issue a statement expressing strong you condemnation don't posters for posters at all? Oh, of course. I mean, I, of course, every candidate, it, I, I think, uses pollsters. The question is whether you determine your positions based on polling, and clearly that's not the case. And I just wanted to go back to what Mrs. Clinton said before, because I think it's important on the educational issue. Uh, Mrs. Clinton said that she was for, for teacher testing. Well, but only for, for new teachers. And what type of testing? In Arkansas, Mrs. Clinton, when you uh, had responsibility for education, the student performance when you left was at the bottom of the barrel. Spending was up. Uh, taxes were up, student performance at the bottom of the barrel. And un, uh, out of the, the governor, uh, now president's own mouth, he said, well, we had to adjust the test. We had to dumb down the tests so that teachers could pass. That was a failure. And I think right now I'm for teacher competency exam examinations for teachers, whether they're new teachers, but more importantly, teachers that have been in the system for some time. I don't understand why you would not want to ha have examinations okay, for teachers that were already in the system Let and perhaps failing our, our children. Let me ask a teacher's type question of you, Mrs. Clinton, uh, about this history in Arkansas. True or false? Yeah, well, it's false, Gabe. And, you know, uh, the work that was done in Arkansas received numerous... Uh, awards and praise because we really started something that I'm very proud of and test scores went up in third grade and sixth grade high school graduation went up uh, the work that was done was done against great odds it obviously was then uh, a very poor state but what's important is what we're going to do in the future so I'm taking the experience that I had where we did test all teachers and a lot of changes have happened. I've been involved in this now for 17 years, working on behalf of education reform. And I think we know what works. We know that uh, getting classroom size down works. That's why I'm for adding 100,000 teachers to the classroom. We know that modernizing and better equipping our schools works. And we know that high standards works. We also know that pay for performance on a school basis works. I'm for that. You know, many of my supporters are not. I think it's the right thing to do. But what's important is to stay committed to the public school system, not siphon off money, as my opponent would, with vouchers, which I think would send us backwards. We'll, we'll, we'll get to vouchers, but what about this question of testing of teachers? Is, is it true what he says, that you're for, for testing new teachers, but not teachers who are already in the system? That's right, and that's what the New York law is. You know, I agree that we should be testing new teachers. I believe that we ought to have... Uh, pay for performance where we evaluate teachers. I think we ought to streamline the due process standards so that teachers that don't measure up would no longer be in the classroom. And I have a long record of achievement and advocacy on behalf of improving education that I will take with me to the Senate. See, I, I, I have a very different perspective. I have a very different perspective on your record in Arkansas. And I would just urge the voters not to rely on what I'm saying <laughs> or perhaps even what Mrs. Clinton is saying with all due respect, but to look it up with their computers, do some research, because on almost the entire range of student performance, how many students got into college, whether they progressed, their literacy levels, there was a, a dramatic reduction in achievement as a result of you the know, work Gabe, that was I'm done. Not, I'm not can, here can, to can, defend can, Arkansas. I'm here can, to can run I, for the Senate can, to represent New York. But I take great, great can I finish offense my point? Okay, you at his misinterpreting point? and mischaracterizing uh, what went can, on. Can I finish my point? I, I realize that you, you don't want to talk about Arkansas because that experience was a disaster for I'm Arkansas. I'm happy to talk about it but what's you want to spend your time talking about, Mr. Blasio. Because that's your record, Mrs. Clinton, with all due respect. We will have posted on the website the facts for anyone who's interested www.hillary.2000 as long as education was brought up uh, let's let's talk about today there is a difference on the question of teacher testing we've we've established that what about on vouchers sure. well what well, can I say also I'm, it, it confounds me actually why you would say to a new teacher that just came out of school and has learned hopefully the most current up to date up-to-date methodology for teaching and they're, they're accustomed to using computers as teaching tools in the classroom why you would say it's okay for them but it's not okay for somebody that's been been out there uh, and and teaching teaching for 15 years and may have lost touch with their ability to use the latest techniques and I think it's because in the end, I don't, I'm not trapped by the status quo. I'm not trapped by the student, uh, by the teachers' unions, which uh, I think Mrs. Clinton is. I, I am for competency tests every five years for every teacher because I want to put our children first. And that's the exact Are same reason. Are you trapped by the teachers' unions, as he says? No. In fact, um, I'm very much uh, in line with what... Uh, 
I think will work and what uh, experts in the field think. You know, I'm a lawyer. I had to take a bar exam. I, I think Mr. Lazio is a lawyer. He took a bar exam and he wasn't tested every five years. I happen to think teachers are professionals and should be treated as professionals. That's Clinton, why I believe Mr. that we should test teachers in the beginning to make sure that when they got their teaching degree, when they got their BA from whatever school they graduated from, they're qualified. And then I believe we should have continuing legal education or teaching education comparable to legal education, which is what we do with other professionals. But, I also can, believe can I, can I that we should have pay for this? performance okay. on the school basis. Can I, can I try to make, make a couple points here? Because I think there's a major difference between Mrs. Clinton and myself on education. Uh, Mrs. Clinton mentioned uh, the legal profession. Uh, it is the case that there is a requirement of continuing education for lawyers so that their skills are kept uh, current. It's also true in the healthcare profession that nurses are expected to be involved in continuing education and sometimes are expected to be retested again. The truth is, is in the end, that I, I believe in making the changes to put our children first. Mrs. Clinton believes in making sure that the decision making on education stays in Washington. I want teachers and parents to make decisions okay, about their education. You have a chance for a rebuttal here, Mr. Well, Clinton. thank you, Gabe. I mean, you don't know where to start with Mr. Lazio. He, uh, he does go on. But the fact is that when I started uh, back in 1983 and proposed teacher testing, uh, I knew that it needed to be done in that particular circumstance. But we've done a lot to improve standards. But I do want to test new teachers. And I do want continuing education and professional advancement and development for our teachers. And I do support pay for performance. And I do support adding qualified teachers to the classroom. Where we part company is that he doesn't support, for example, the 100,000 teachers in the classroom uh, in Congress. And he has not uh, gone along with the bipartisan plan to build and repair our schools so that we actually can have those lower classroom sizes. And he supports vouchers, which I oppose. So I think that any fair reading of the record would show that we do have significant differences. I want to go on to some other issues on the Out of fairness, I think it's important, because Mrs. Clinton has repeated these things several times, both in the commercials, which the Daily News has called her on and called her advertising absolutely false. And now I want a chance to be able to rebut that. Mrs. Clinton, you well know by now, because I know you're a smart woman, that I have voted twice to reduce class size, twice for billions to help us recruit new teachers. Uh, I, have, I have been a co-sponsor of bipartisan legislation for school construction. You know that. Uh, it, it's, what's important here is that we understand the difference between the two candidates. Mrs. Clinton believes that all the decisions should be made in Washington, that we should force categorical programs. I understand that communities should be making those decisions on a community by community basis. No bureaucrat in Washington, no senator in Washington is ever going to know all the needs of a school. Some schools are going to need new textbooks, some principals, some teachers. I want to provide maximum flexibility to do that. And my education plan, which is a $97 billion plan, would do just that, would provide additional money for science and technology, okay. for new teachers, and for flexibility let with me, the hometown choice Let me program. blow the whistle here on the education issue. Uh, some headlines from a selection of press releases and commercials by both campaigns. Hillary Clinton plays politics with women's health again. The latest distortions from the Clinton campaign and from your side. Lazio points fingers, plays politics instead of voting for a resolution condemning Palestinian violence. Lazio soft money hypocrisy. You would think from all these things uh, that I read uh, coming over the transom and directly to us on the fax machines that you dislike each other. Is that true? Well, I, I think the, the, the difference is here. It's not a matter of personal dislike. I think it's a matter for on our side to point up the differences between candidates and the philosophy uh, between two candidates. I think, for example, it's important to point out uh, on a number of, of different issues that there's a major difference. Uh, you, you talked about... what's called a filibuster gate. Yeah, let me ask you about, about, <laughs> about the, emo well, the emotional content here. Do you dislike him? No, I think that uh, I have uh, no personal animus at all toward Mr. Lazio. Uh, seems like a, a very, you know, nice uh, person. Well, I just have name, a great well, deal name, of... name three things that you like about him and you name three things you like about her. Well, it seems like he has a very nice family right. and that uh, he, uh, you know, has uh, worked very hard uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, he's an attractive uh, young man. And you? 
Well, I think you're an attractive woman, and uh, <laughs> I you. think you've got a very nice family. I'm sure you're a very good mother as well. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that, that But that's not what this election's <laughs> about. And what it is about uh, are the very significant differences between us on everything like education uh, and health care and the economy and the environment and guns and choice and Social Security and the budget surplus. and. Uh, what we've been doing in the campaign is running a campaign on issues, talking about okay. where I stand and what I would do in Let's the Senate. Let's talk about some of these issues. In recent week, weeks, scores of people have been killed in the Middle East. Palestinian leaders have blamed Israel and vice versa. Israeli Prime Minister Barak made far-reaching concessions, in his view, to the Palestinians. But in view of what's happened, do you think there should be a Palestinian state now? only as part of a comprehensive peace agreement. That's always been my position, that if there were a comprehensive peace agreement that guaranteed Israel safety and security, and the parties agreed at the negotiating table, uh, but a unilateral declaration is uh, absolutely unacceptable, and it would mean the end of any U.S. aid. What about you? Well, I, I guess that's a change of heart for Mrs. Clinton, because back in 1998, you called for a Palestinian state. You undercut the Israeli negotiating position, and the administration had to rush in to try and distance themselves from you. The problem is, is that many people around the world, and the Palestinian Authority looks at you and your comments and your proximity to the White House, and your role in the White House, and when you call for a Palestinian state, when you accept contributions from people that support Hamas, when you invite them to the White House and they're your guests, you send a message out to the world and to the Palestinian Authority that encourages violence to be used as a tool to achieve oh, political minute. ends. Wait a minute, didn't, didn't your presidential candidate, George W. Bush, it's also wrong. accept it's, contributions? It's, it's absolutely wrong. The difference is, it's, it's absolutely wrong for all. It's absolutely wrong for all. The difference, though, on top of receiving the contributions and attending the fundraiser, and being honored by a group, the leader of which says it is, it is perfectly acceptable to use murder and violence as a to, tool to achieve political ends, is that, that people who support the Hamas group, which is a terrorist group, have been invited a, and courted at the White House, which I think is wrong. And I think yeah, it's one reason why... Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to sit here and, and let him go on if that's how we no, want to no. spend but the Mrs. hour. Clinton, but frankly, I think it's, a, I think it's though, appropriate, Gabe, that... I think she, that, has, uh, she has a, that, a right uh, to answer. And fact, after he's done... Yeah. Uh, so many um, inac made so many inaccurate statements. Which one? You know, okay. All right, let's, you know, let's, let's you know, Gabe. Okay, what? I'm, uh, I'm, the I'm the speaker of the House. <laughs> I'm the speaker of the House. You remember. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Gabe. You know, Gabe, um, I learned that an organization claimed credit for sponsoring a fundraiser I attended. And it's an organization whose members have made statements that I find offensive and uh, have condemned. Uh, and as soon as I found out the facts, I returned all of the money that was raised. Because I did not want anyone to have a false impression about my strong support for Israel's safety and security. You're talking and about the American Muslim Alliance. That's right. And uh, I also think it's important to note that I have called on Arafat, uh, Chairman Arafat, to denounce violence and to do everything in his power to end it. And, you know, just today we've had more violence and it's very distressing and it's something that uh, the United States uh, uh, must stand strongly behind Israel in uh, responding to. I have called for uh, an investigation and the end of aid if the Palestinian textbooks uh, continued with their teaching of hatred and making anti-Semitic statements. Uh, and I have also said clearly that uh, uh, there should be no unilateral declaration of a Palestinian state and that the embassy should be moved to Jerusalem, our embassy, by the end of the Would year. Would you favor cutting off water and uh, power uh, to the uh, Palestinian side if all else fails, which has been suggested in uh, Israel proper? Well, that will be a decision for the Israeli government to make, but I want to just respond directly to what is really the implication of Mr. Lazio's statement. You know, I am not only a friend of Israel, but the friends of Israel know that I am. I'm supported by people like Eli Wiesel and Joe Lieberman and Chuck Schumer and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And I was very honored to receive the endorsements from the Forward and the Long Island Jewish World. And I think that uh, your continuing efforts are really to deflect attention from our differences on issues and where you stand when it comes to what we would do domestically here at home to keep the economy going and what's the best way to improve education and take care of health care. And, you know, I think that we've got to get down to talk about what the differences are because the people are going to be making a choice on November 7th that will have very big implications for the next six years. Abe Foxman, the uh, the the head of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, says that these um, 
organizations, these Muslim organizations, can be in the mainstream when they condemn terrorism. I agree with that. You agree I, with Abe that? and I have talked about that. I agree mm. with that. Mm. That certainly every American should right. be part of the political process, but no American should uh, in any way give aid and comfort to terrorists. And it's especially important today when we see uh, the bombing of the USS Cole and the loss of 17 of our young men and women, which was just an evil act of terrorism. Do you want to I, comment I, briefly? I do want to comment if I can. I think, first of all, the, the people of New York want to have somebody who has a consistent record. And for eight years, I have been consistent and strong in my support for the security of the state of Israel, without equivocation, without a question mark next to my name. You know, it is important for people to understand when you cavort with terrorists, with people that, that pronounce that violence and murder can be used as a tool to achieve political ends, you give them credibility. You embolden them and you send a message out to the world. Now, I think it was important that in the hours after uh, the United States failed to use its veto to, uh, in the UN Security Council, Council, which I think was one of the, the the great mistakes of the last few years, that I spoke out immediately. Uh, I'm sure that Mrs. Clinton had a chance to speak with her husband about this, uh, with the president about this, to urge him not to use that veto. I would love to know what the context, context of the to discussion urge him was. To not to use it or to use it? To, uh, to urge him to, to use, use the veto. I, that, that was what I urged my husband to do. Uh, yeah, well, he made a different decision. But, you know, when we're talking about strong and unequivocal support, there is no question mark next to me. There's an exclamation point. I'm an emphatic unwavering supporter of Israel's safety and security. And in fact, I've done it at some cost, indeed, Mr. Lazio, okay, because when the, question, when the, let me finish, please. When the Independence Party was considering who to nominate, I made it very clear that I would not run on a party line with Pat Buchanan because of his anti-Semitic comments. You were more than happy to accept that that's particular not, that's not totally line. Accurate. Oh, that's well, not totally accurate. First of all, that's your how people, it was reported. That's, that's, you, your people were up there working hard for that, number one. Number two is... They're working uh, hard for the Independence Party. Like, number, number two... I, you I specifically I, said publicly that I wouldn't take it if they nominated Pat Buchanan. Could, it was up I, to them to decide what to do, and I they try would not make that. Finish my point, Gail, yeah. if I can, uh, and I'm happy to yeah. to try and allow. But, but why, you wouldn't know, you, why wouldn't you take it? Because yes. I wouldn't want to be associated with Pat Buchanan, who has a record of anti-Semitic comments, and Which, I made that very clear at the time. And, you can go back and, and look you know, at my answering comments. questions from you, Gabe, how I felt about him and condemned him, uh, and and uh, the, the, the fact that he has been intolerant. But the point is, it's very hard to accept a record or a, a claim of consistency when you call for a Palestinian state with full military powers. Uh, it's very difficult to accept uh, that you are a consistent supporter when you stand on the sidelines while Suha Arafat issues a blood libel suggesting that Israelis uh, have been orchestrating an attack on Palestinian women and children uh, with with poison. It's very difficult for a consistent supporter <laughs> when you refuse when you refuse uh, to support the law, which says that we should move our embassy to Jerusalem not next year, not at the end of the year like, after eight years, but right now. For eight years, I've wanted that embassy to be placed you know, in Jerusalem. I, I can only respond because you know, as the forward said when they endorsed me. Um, Jewish voters should reject smear campaigns, inaccurate information, much of, which, much of which is floating around. But what's inaccurate you know, about that? My, Be fair. My positions, <laughs> yeah. my positions for more than 20 years have been to do everything I could to support Israel and to increase the relationships between the United States and Israel. I've worked uh, on everything from the National Council of Jewish Women's uh, program to bring a, a, a pre-instruction, uh, preschool instruction program for children to the United States you know, to speaking out time and time again about violence and terrorism. And I can only say that a fair reading, as opposed to a partisan uh, depiction, as we're hearing now, led to the endorsement of Ali Wiesel, who had never endorsed anyone before, and led to the endorsement by the Forward and the Long Island Jewish World. And I think they are better sources for judging my commitment than my opponent. Did you accept the uh, independence nomination? No. That's because it wasn't offered. No, I mean, it <laughs> wasn't offered to either one of us. To, to, be, to, to, be fair about, to be fair about that. Did your, did your people try to get it? We made a presentation to the Independence Party, and at, at every moment I said the, uh, as you, that, that the, the presidential candidate that I support was Governor Bush. Mm -hmm. Okay, campaign finance. Uh, the uh, issue has been raised kind of inferentially uh, previously, but uh, 
one thing that disturbs people about your fundraising, Mr. Lazio, is that you've taken contributions from the housing industry and that you serve on a committee that regulates housing. Is this likely to instill confidence in the voters? Well, I, I think that if you look at the average donation that I receive, it's like less than $100, Gabe. We have rejected the use of soft money in this campaign. My campaign has neither raised nor spent a dollar of soft money, uh, which is a very different experience from my opponent from Mrs. Clinton's campaign. Uh, we could have easily decided to go down that road of trying to raise a lot of money in very large denominations, but decided against it. Uh, I have done a good deal of work in the House of Representatives. Of course, I've been very active on housing issues, on helping the homeless, helping p poor people with public housing, helping Native Americans. That's where my work has been. And, and to promote the idea that the elderly should be able to live in housing with good supportive services. Uh, I have supported those efforts. But have uh, you gotten uh, contributions, heavy contributions from the housing industry? We've, we've gotten contributions from a whole range of people with different interests that are important to the quality of life of New Yorkers. Do New Yorkers care about the homeless? I believe they do, and that's why I've authored legislation to help them. Not public housing residents, the most sweeping reform in public housing history was authored by me and passed in the House and signed into law, which I'm proud to say. Well, Gabe, let me perhaps enlighten you on his record since he did not. He received a million dollars in contributions from uh, the home building industry and from the manufacturers of homes. And in return, at least there is an appearance that he did several things. He fought to weaken the safety standards for manufactured housing and in-home building. True or uh, false? That's absolutely false, and you know it, Mrs. Clinton. Please, do not well, make up things. Mr. Lazio, you just, <laughs> quoted, you just referred to the Daily News, which ran an investigative uh, article, which made exactly that point. That, in is, addition, absolute, that is absolutely false. Well, you, but it, Let me tell it you something, Mrs. That, Clinton. In eight years, there's one thing that I will not tolerate, and that's being dragged down into the mud. My reputation is impeccable. My integrity is impeccable. Never in my life has anybody accused me of doing a single thing because of who supported me. I am very proud of my record okay. on housing. But may I gave for sure. a minute? Because I I'm sorry to be so emphatic about this. There's been nobody else in the House of Representatives who stood up for poor people and to provide them with good quality housing. Now, are you going to complain about that? The fact that I've been there for the homeless, I've been there to provide housing for people with AIDS, well, I've been there for Native American people, I've been there for people who rely on yeah. Section 8 vouchers, that I'm boosting home ownership for our okay. young families. In, in fact, I'll be meeting with a group of public housing tenants this evening because uh, what their uh, memory of that uh, fight was, Mr. Lazio, is that you were trying to okay. remove the caps from the limits that would right, in some way prohibit a lot of people from being able to have the public housing that they needed let's, because you were going what, to make it available to more people than just the very right, poorest of the poor. But let me just go I, back, Gabe, for a to, minute. I'd be happy to talk about not housing. Only, not uh, only, is, housing there, not only is there a problem with the home builders and the safety standards, yeah. but the FHA was trying to increase the limits that would enable a person to want to be a homeowner to be able to borrow at low interest. And my opponent uh, fought that. He did not want those limits raised. Okay. And around the time time of that fight, he received uh, significant right, contributions do, 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 from more, the mortgage do, do, do uh, banking you industry. Do you understand that the, that the standards that you're talking about were endorsed by the administration's Department of Housing and Urban Development? Do you, do you understand that? Do you understand that the standards I'm talking about that you were trying right. to weaken were but, said by the AARP that okay, they now, would have put people they're, they're, in danger? They've endorsed the bill. Okay, now in the interest of fairness, I want to ask you about your contributions. That's fair. There, there have been big contributors to your campaign. Reportedly, they got sleepovers at the White House or coffees. Doesn't that cause a perception among men, many voters that they're cut out of the process, that the big fat cats, they get to sleep at the White House or to be entertained at the White House? Well, you know, Gabe, the vast majority of people who uh, spend the night with us at the White House are family, friends, and supporters who've never contributed to my campaign. And, in fact, the vast majority of my contributors, more than 150,000, uh, have never spent the night at the White House. But it is true that uh, my what about, husband... What about that minority? Well, my husband and I do entertain people who are our friends and our supporters. It would be rather unusual that uh, there might not be some among them who have contributed to the campaign, but there's never been any kind of quid pro quo. And, in fact, to me, the idea of being able to uh, contribute to a campaign ought to be as broadly spread as possible. And most people who contribute to you, I think, are people that you'd want to spend some time with. But the Lincoln bedroom 
isn't that sort of a sacrosanct place? And isn't the White House itself a, a, a museum? Something that belongs well, to the people of the United States, not is. to any particular president or any particular party. That, that's right. And it's also the home of the president during the time that uh, the president uh, is in office. And we have been honored to have lived there now for nearly eight years. And we've tried to share it with many, many people. And as I say, the vast majority of the people are friends and and supporters, family members, uh, people that uh, we know and respect. Uh, uh, we've also entertained, you know, royalty as well as very uh, so nothing, famous nothing athletes and actors. Nothing about a, a, a contributor spending time. No, there isn't. Okay. Now, uh, health care, as you look at it, what is the essential difference between you and the man sitting across the way from you right now on the subject of health care? Well, I have a plan about uh, how I think we should expand uh, quality, affordable health care. It's something I've worked on for some time, uh, learned a lot about, uh, and feel that we should uh, make the kinds of advances in a step-by-step -step way that will enable us to cover everyone. I was pleased to be part of the Children's Health Insurance Program and uh, doing things like adding mammograms to Medicare and ending drive-by deliveries and making insurance portable. But now we need to do more, and that's why I have specific ideas uh, in order to do that. I also support the bipartisan Patients' Bill of Rights that puts doctors and nurses back right. in the decision-making position and a prescription drug benefit for Medicare that would cover everyone. The essential difference, as you see it, or differences between you and uh, Mr. Lazio? Well, it's hard to tell because he hasn't come forward with any specific plan or ideas, and he has opposed uh, the bipartisan Patients' Bill of Rights that I support, and his prescription drug benefit would not cover uh, all the seniors in New York and America. Your, your turn. Well, I absolutely have a plan, uh, and I have been active for eight years on health issues. I serve on the health committee. I formed the Cancer Task Force. Uh, I'm the author of the Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Act, which was just signed into law that will provide uh, treatment to low-income women who suffer with breast and cervical cancer. I believe deeply in the federal commitment to biomedical research and support the doubling of the amount of federal dollars to go into research. I've done that as a member of Congress. I'll do that in the Senate. Uh, I was on the committee and helped write the children's health formula, and we worked together with Governor Pataki to make sure that it worked for New York. Now 500,000 New York children are covered by that. I support the extension of the use of Medicaid for the use of families, low-income families. I want to allow deductibility uh, for the self-employed, for people that are employed by, by employers who don't offer health insurance. Uh, so I want to aggressively deal with both the quality issues. I have twice voted for patients, uh, for two different right. versions of the Patients' Bill of Rights. I would like to have small businesses be able to group together to buy uh, insurance at more favorable rates to, to pass it on to their employees. Okay. That will address millions and millions about, of Americans. What about the signing of that breast cancer uh, uh, bill by the president, which was done in private, according to the Times, to avoid any awkward moment where one of the co-sponsors sitting over here might be present? Well, you know, it's the rare bill that gets a public signing. In fact, I think of the last 92 that have been passed, only six got public signings. This is a very important bill, and it's one that I worked on and supported and feel strongly about. And it, like other important uh, health bills, uh, didn't get a public signing like the Ryan White bill, but there will be a public ceremony to talk about the advances uh, in health care uh, at the White House and bringing everybody together to do just that. Uh, but I'd like to just make a point about uh, something that the congressman said, because I think that New Yorkers should know the whole story. Uh, he's talked on several occasions about the breast and cervical cancer bill, and it is true that he has worked on behalf of breast cancer issues. Uh, and was an original sponsor of this bill, along with Congresswoman Anna Eshoo from California. But when the Republican leadership decided that they didn't want to fund the bill, he didn't join the fight. In fact, uh, as it was said in the New York Times yesterday, uh, he didn't really go uh, to the fight with uh, the breast cancer advocates, and they even said he was sometimes hard to reach. Instead, he reintroduced the bill in his own name, without the money that was needed to put it into effect, and when it came for a vote in the House uh, a week or so ago, he was not there to vote for it, even though the outcome was somewhat in doubt. So that on time and time again, when it came to this bill, which he does uh, try to uh, take credit for, the credit really belongs to the breast cancer advocates. Uh, and in fact, uh, I just don't think that uh, 
this is a bill that we should be playing Mitch politics Mitch with Mitch because breast, because breast can my opponent is breast, playing politics breast with breast cancer is, right uh, now. Breast cancer. May I finish, Gabe? Uh, yeah. breast, <laughs> breast cancer is too important uh, an okay, issue. And this is a bill that, can I, can I, now that it's been signed, should get into can I, can I uh, to, place so people can, can use it. Can I try to it. respond to right some to of these rebuttal. false allegations? Yeah. Uh, I think it's important for New Yorkers to know that I introduced this bill not in this Congress, but in the Congress previous to this Congress. I introduced it with Senators Moynihan and Senators D'Amato. Now, we weren't able to move it quick enough to get it passed in the last Congress, so I reintroduced it. I'm the author of this legislation. I am the one who moved it through committee. I am the one who had it scheduled for floor action. <clears throat> I'm the one who was able to persuade the Senate to move it. Uh, and Mrs. Clinton, I don't know Perhaps you helped in some way, but I never saw you as the author of the, pers of the bill and as the architect of the bill and as the architect of the strategy that moved this bill through the House and had it uh, to the point where it got uh, the president's signature. Never noticed that you were involved with it at all. And that's fine. I mean, the idea that, it's, that there was no public signing ceremony, I mean, I would have been glad to step aside, Gabe, and, not, and have had that because I think it's important for to well, promote in, breast in, cancer awareness. In fact, awareness. I was working with Anna Eshoo, the original sponsor, who you cut out when you reintroduced the bill, and Mrs. I was working... That's, that's, that's False, and I was working with breast cancer advocates Clinton, who were not, fighting so Clinton, hard to they, get they that were, bill they passed. They Clinton, deserve the credit Clinton, that, because they're the ones who day in and day out can fought we, against the oh, Republican can I, try, can I just try and get the truth through for one <clears throat> moment, please, I Gabe? Think, I think you both have had an opportunity to talk about this <laughs> issue, and it's quite clear to me. Uh, although I must point out that the New York Times piece by Joyce Pernick yesterday said that uh, you both worked for the bill, but neither one of you uh, deserves... Uh, absolute credit for it. That, uh, that's the way I, I read it. Yeah, well, I, I, I yeah. think that the, the people from the National Breast Cancer Coalition who had a press conference uh, to praise my work on it, the people that were deeply involved in this, the fact that I managed this bill on the floor myself, uh, and the fact that I've introduced it and was the author of this bill. Now, people may not want to acknowledge that, and that's fine because the most important thing is that we got this job done. Uh, but the fact is, is that I don't think there's anybody who is a more active proponent of efforts to try and okay. combat cancer or breast cancer in the House, and I will be the same type of person in the Senate. Let's move on to another visceral issue, abortion. Both of you are pro-choice, but you differ on the issue of uh, Medicaid funding to enable poor women to get abortions. Uh, is that uh, something that you think morally is defensible? If, if abortion is legal, why should poor women have to resort to perhaps back alley abortions? Well, I think that women should have a right to an abortion. My record reflects that. I have support Roe v. Wade. Uh, but I also believe that we should try and ensure that people have uh, as many other alternatives as possible. I believe in family planning. I've supported that. I've supported the right of federal employees to have abortion services as part of their health plan. I've supported the efforts of people to ensure that they have safe, fair access to abortion clinics. I've supported family planning, both internationally and here in America. Uh, on the Medicaid issue, I simply would leave that up to the states to decide how best to do that. And what about the, the question of the new president, whoever he may be, uh, <clears throat> having perhaps uh, the right to appoint four, maybe three Supreme Court justices? Is that going to overturn Roe v. Wade? Are you going to fight for uh, justices who will, if you become the senator, uh, who will... Uh, Support it. I'm going to support Roe v. Wade. I'm going to support Roe v. Wade. I'm going to look for the best, most qualified uh, uh, nominee for the for the Supreme Court. People that have a healthy respect for precedent. And in that sense, I have the same view of both presidential candidates, <coughs> both Vice President Gore and Governor Bush, who both say there ought to be no litmus test. We ought to look for the most qualified, experienced jurist, a jurist with the right temperament, a jurist with a healthy respect for precedent. As a lawyer, don't you feel that that's the way to go when you're picking a judge, to have somebody who has a healthy respect for precedent and will weigh things on the merits and not with preconceived ideas? Well, I am pro-choice, and I'm honored to be endorsed by Planned Parenthood and NARAL New York because I do believe that uh, women have this fundamental right under our Constitution, and that includes poor women. Uh, I support uh, not only Medicaid funding for abortion, but I support Medicaid funding for RU486, both of which my opponent does not. When it comes to the Supreme Court, I believe uh, that there are certain constitutional rights that are so fundamental uh, that we must stand up and defend those. I would not support any nominee who would uh, go to the Supreme Court and uh, overturn Roe v. Wade and turn back the clock on women's rights. 
I've said that uh, for months. My opponent will not make that simple statement. But I would also not uh, vote for someone who was against Brown v. Board of Education. I would look into the record of the person. I take the Constitution seriously. Uh, and I hold strong views about uh, protecting these fundamental rights, and I would uh, evaluate a nominee based on those views. Partial birth abortion. You said that uh, if the mother's health is in danger, uh, you would be in favor of partial birth abortion. How do you judge whether the mother's health is in danger? Well, I would leave that to the medical professionals. I don't think that should be a governmental decision. I have said, uh, and I would support legislation that would uh, eliminate uh, late-term so-called partial birth abortion uh, if the health and life of the mother were not at stake. And I believe uh, that there is a way to have a framework for medical decision-making that would allow us to determine that. That's the same position that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who my opponent uh, uh, has singled out as being his uh, favorite justice, uh, pointed us to in her last opinion. And I think that it could be done. There's a bill that has been introduced by Democrats in the Senate that I would support if I were there. And instead of playing politics with abortion, we should try to figure out how to do this in a constitutionally permissible, medically acceptable way. And you? Well, I, I support the ban on partial birth abortions. I take the same position as Senator Moynihan, who called uh, this horrific procedure infanticide, the same position as uh, mayor, former New York City Mayor Ed Koch, who believes it's wrong. And I think that it is important for us to make a statement that the procedure of partial birth abortion is just morally wrong. Even when the health of I would create an exception. The life of the mother. I would create an exception, and I supported the exception of the life for the mother. Uh, but to open this up to, to nebulous health standards and mental health standards is to eviscerate the entire idea of the ban. Either you're for it or you're against it. Uh, and I think we ought not to be passing things for political cover. We ought to be supporting things that we truly believe in that have meaning. Uh, and, and if you don't believe in it, that's fine, but don't try and have it both ways. Now, you both have taken a stand on abortion, which is a, a moral stand, and I wonder about the death penalty. Uh, if you accept the ideology of the pro-life people that you can't be against abortion without being against the death penalty, uh, you say you're pro-choice, but is that inconsistent with being for the... De well, what I'm trying to say is, what about the immorality of so many people in this country, according to recent uh, studies, being on death row who have been represented by incompetent lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Ryan of Illinois, your home state, uh, took a stand calling for a moratorium on executions until we find out whether the death penalty has been applied uh, unjustly. Uh, do you think that you would have the guts to favor a moratorium on the death penalty, even though um, a majority of people perhaps are for it. Well, I, I'm a former prosecutor and, and have yeah. been deeply engaged in law enforcement issues for my entire career, and I support the death penalty, but I also believe that people have an absolute right to competent counsel. It is immoral to ask uh, somebody, uh, to, to a judge, to, to make a decision when, when the defendant is being represented by an incompetent counsel. We've had situations where counsel has even been sleeping while uh, the, right. the uh, sentencing has gone on, and that's wrong. I, I think it's also important for us to use DNA evidence. Now that we have science and we have the ability to, to be able to use science to identify the correct person, every person sitting on death row ought to have access to DNA evidence, uh, and that evidence ought to be very instrumental in terms of allowing whether or not we decide whether people should, should face the capital punishment. Well, Gabe, this is one of those moments of rare agreement, and uh, I absolutely agree. I support the death penalty. I came to that decision when I was a law professor, and I had to stand up in front of a classroom filled with young people and answer questions, but I also believe that it should be uh, applied only in the most uh, obvious cases, and that it only should be applied after there's been uh, a fair uh, judicial proceeding where the defendant is well represented, where the defendant and his counsel have access to uh, forensic evidence such as DNA. So since there's so much evidence uh, that it's not applied fairly, uh, why not have a moratorium until we sort it out? Well, I support uh, legislation in the Senate sponsored by Senator Leahy from Vermont, where we would uh, look to uh, see uh, how we could equip uh, the defense counsel in the federal system. 
uh, so that they are very well prepared for uh, defending anyone accused of a capital offense. Most of these cases, as you know, are carried out on the state level. Uh, I respected Governor Ryan when he reached a decision based on the merits of what was happening in Illinois. I was frankly taken aback by Governor Bush's assertion that everyone on death row in Texas was there uh, appropriately. Uh, and I do think that the states should take a very hard look at how they implement the death penalty. Uh, and that would certainly be something I'd call for. Do you agree with that? Well, I think that, that people ought to have a review on a case-by-case -case basis. I think an across-the-board moratorium uh, may seem attractive at face value, but it's also important to enforce the law and, but at the same time, provide people with the correct protections, including uh, access to DNA evidence and to make sure that we have a provision for competent counsel. Now, uh, racial profiling, it's one of the most vexing issues in urban America. Here in New York City, two federal prosecutors have found that police brutality exists. Uh, an investigation by Attorney General Spitzer found that in most cases, thousands of black and Latino New Yorkers especially have been stopped and frisked without sufficient cause. Would you favor a national Senate investigation uh, to see whether there is profiling going on? I think racial profiling uh, does exist in different places around America. I think there's little doubt at this point, given all the evidence that's come in. And I think it's wrong. Uh, and I think it, it, is, it, it is and ought to be illegal. Uh, people ought not to be stopped uh, and frisked simply because of the color of their skin. Uh, as, as a prosecutor, I'm offended by that. As a former would prosecutor. Favor, would you favor a federal monitor? I, I don't necessarily think that we need Big Brother from Washington coming in. I think we can do this at the, at the, at the state level. I believe enough in New Yorkers that we can deal with this issue uh, both at the state and city level. I think it's important for us to address the issue, uh, but I don't think that there's any reason to believe that the people <coughs> in Washington have any higher moral or ethical standard than New Yorkers have. I think we can do that job ourselves. What about you? Um, I'm against uh, racial profiling, and I think there ought to be federal legislation uh, to outlaw racial profiling. I would certainly support that, uh, because I've talked to so many uh, black and Latino New Yorkers who have been stopped and frisked or pulled over uh, for no apparent reason other than the color of their skins or their accent, uh, and that is just not uh, what we should be doing in America. Uh, so I would certainly do everything I could uh, to end uh, uh, racial profiling and encourage you know, better training, better ways of uh, uh, looking uh, for um, and apprehending uh, criminals uh, that wouldn't rely on discriminatory practices like racial profiling. Right, now, let's, let's move on and just get a couple of quick answers on things that I think have fallen through the cracks. We didn't really discuss vouchers no. and whether they're, they're good you. or bad. Thank you. What about, what about you, Mrs. Clinton? How do you feel about school vouchers to enable uh, parents who believe that their kids are not being well educated? to get private education. Well, Gabe, I support uh, legislation to turn around failing schools. I support a lot of the uh, techniques that have worked uh, here in New York as well as around the country to make sure that children do have access to a quality education. And I have a specific uh, set of proposals to do that. I cannot, though, support vouchers. I support public school choice where the dollars stay in the public school system. But I cannot support siphoning off public dollars to the private or the religious uh, schools uh, in an area. And I say that for several reasons. First, I've been in so many schools in New York that are some of the best in the entire world, but others that are really woefully uh, inadequate. And those schools don't have a lot of the resources that we need right now to provide first-class education. So I don't think we can afford to send public dollars to private what schools. About and, that? and secondly, you know, the experiments that have been done on vouchers have not proven successful or convincing to me. And finally, I have yet to have anyone explain to me how we would provide a constitutionally acceptable voucher system that would send public dollars to uh, religious schools, schools that right. uh, um, are clearly uh, teaching um, religious lessons because that is their mission. What about the stripping uh, money from the public schools that that need it desperately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have a $97 billion education plan, and of that $97 billion, the vast majority is spent to try and recruit the best and brightest to ensure that the teachers uh, that we recruit to finish at the top of their college classes have their 
their tuition paid for, that they are helped, that we create mentoring programs, alternative certification programs, legislation that I have sponsored in the House and have passed the House. Uh, I believe in this. I believe in investing in science and technology. I also believe in a hometown choice program that leaves the decision making to teachers and principals and parents. And again, another major philosophical difference. Five billion dollars in new spending, not a dime of which comes from public uh, school funding, we set up in, in a parental choice program. To me, I think, Gabe, that it is immoral to force a child to go to a school where they're not safe or where they can't learn. 80% in a current, recent poll, a Hunter College poll, 80% of African American parents and Hispanic parents want to get their children out of schools that they're currently trapped in. Schools that have been failing not just for one or two years, some schools that have been failing for 10 years. Now, how many of us would tolerate that if that was our, our, that was our children? The, the most important way that we can bridge the issue of the income divide, of the haves and have nots, is to make sure that low income children that are living in disadvantaged communities have access to good quality education okay, and not to trap them into bad schools that have been failing for many, many, many years. Let's, let's, okay, the question is though, would uh, these vouchers that uh, Mr. Lazio supports be used in any kind of religious school? Are, are, are there certain distinctions that the government then draws between what is acceptable or unacceptable well, religious I, I instruction? Think, I think right now we use yeah. uh, federal funding for a whole range of different services. The Department of Housing and Urban right. Development does it. But we if, use it for I drug were, and alcohol. If, if I, were to I come, may just finish if, my point, please. <clears throat> uh, my uh, drug and okay. alcoholism counseling. The point is if you use it for a secular purpose and not a religious purpose, well, this, it, it, it is... It is so so in other words, if I were to come to the voucher authority in the government and say that I belong to the Church of the White Supremacist, I want my, Clinton, I want Clinton, my voucher let's, let's, for let's the school trust, let's try and that goes with let's my give, church. Let's give parents and families a I'm little a bit parent. more credit I, than that. I want that but let me uh, ask you this. Right. If, we have that kind of, if we had that kind of school uh, right now, I'd say that you'd have a valid point. We have no such school in New York. The, the point is here is stop trapping children, poor children, okay, in failing schools. No one Why has, do you want to trap them? Let me, pound, let me Mr. pound Mr. the gavel here and go on to but, but No to one has worked harder than I have but, to improve but, school. But right, it seems right, to me, right. I, mean, I think this is a major, a major order, difference of opinion. Order, order. I just want to put our children first, that's right. all. The speaker wants order. Um, I want to ask you something that's more emotional and personal. Um, are you reconciled to losing? You and you? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what will you do if that happens, if you should lose? Will you continue to live in New York? Well, I will, I will live in New York after I win. I will live in New York um, for the rest of my life. In, I'm in Chappaqua? Well, I'm absolutely committed, yes. I, I, you know, I was thinking about this when the series ended uh, last night, um, uh, and it was a great series. And the Mets lost. Yes, they did, <laughs> and the Yankees won. Uh, but what I was uh, struck by was how, you know, people who weren't uh, born in New York could deliver for New York. And I feel that way um, every day. I go out and talk with people, and I think about what we can do together, and I'm very excited about it. So you expect to win, but if you lost, you would uh, stay here? Absolutely. Practice law? Well, that, that may be too far a stretch. I'm not sure about that. But, I would, you know, I'd want to teach and write and, and, and work uh, on the causes I've worked on for more than 30 years. Well, you know, Gabe, I, I I've, was born here. I've lived here my entire life. All of my friends and family are here. My home is here. Uh, these are where my roots go deep into this, this New York soil. Uh, you can rest assured, no matter what happens with this election, you check on me a year from now, we're going to still be living uh, on Windsor Avenue and Brightwaters as we have been uh, for these last 10 years. Uh, so I have to say, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's no question, I think, in people's mind about my devotion to New York, my loyalty to New York, my lifelong commitment to this state, my 17 years of public service. This isn't just about running for office right now. It's about being a prosecutor, a village attorney, a county legislator, about serving New York for eight years in the House of Representatives, right. going to bat for New York on transportation issues, children's you'll health issues. You'll stay in public life no matter what. I, I, I hope to have a role in, in public I believe in that. Now, You've been accused of being a co-president. Is if you win, is your oh my husband? Gosh, that's one of the nicest things I've been accused. Of. <laughs> is your husband going to be a co-senator? Oh, I think my husband's going to be very busy after uh, his term ends in January. He's got uh, a lot of ideas about what he work wants to work on. But certainly, I'm going to look forward to having his advice, and I'm going to be delighted that he'll be active in the life of New York because if, he'll have a lot to say and contribute. And if, and if you lose, are you going to start baking cookies? As you <laughs>
<laughs> you know what? When I win, I'll bake you some cookies, Gabe. I, what's your favorite kind? I'll, I'll be sure chocolate to bring them. Chocolate chip, of chocolate, course. Chocolate. I've got a great chocolate chip <laughs> recipe. You'll be the first. You know what's interesting about the president coming in, Gabe, is is that the Air Force One came in, flew into New York. I think because of all the excitement that Pat Lazio was generating as she moved around the state. So I, I, I am very proud of the fact that uh, my, my wife is connecting so well with the people that uh, she has lived around and been a neighbor to for so many years. Well, we're up to the closing statements as determined by a coin to us earlier. And uh, you get the first one, a minute, and then uh, Mrs. Clinton, you. Thank you, Gabe. Well, as you confirm or make your decision regarding this race, I ask you to distinguish, distinguish between uh, myself and my opponent based on one simple word, trust. My opponent, well, she wants to make all the decisions over your life. She trusts herself and the federal government to make the decisions, whether it's in health care, on education, or on how much of your own hard-earned money that you get to keep. I trust you, the people, to make your own decisions and to have control over your own life. On my health care plan, I trust doctors and patients to decide. On my education plan, I put the decisions in the hands of, of parents as to how to best work with both principals and teachers. In my economic development plan, I create jobs and I also ensure that we boost take-home pay by returning billions and billions of dollars back to New York. Your minute is up, and now uh, the First Lady, Mrs. Clinton. Well, Gabe, I want to thank you, uh, and I want to thank the people of New York. You know, for 16 months, I've been in all 62 counties, and I've had a chance to listen to uh, the concerns of people, people upstate who are heartbroken that their children had to leave because they couldn't find good work, people here in the city who are worried about the future of education, and people throughout the state who wonder about uh, whether we're going to have uh, the health care system that we need. I want New Yorkers to know that you can trust me to fight for you. I will fight for a budget that pays down the debt, takes care of Social Security, and adds a prescription drug benefit to Medicare. I will fight for public education to put a qualified teacher in a modern classroom throughout the state. I'll fight for health care, a real patient's bill of rights, a Medicare prescription drug benefit that covers everyone. I'll fight for the environment. I'll fight for choice. I'll be there fighting for you. And that concludes our discussion. You may now log on to WNBC.com to watch the reactions of the Marist Polls scientifically selected group of undecided voters. I'll be there online with Dr. Lee Meringoff, the director of the Marist Poll. Feel free to ask questions of either of us or of the undecided voters. And thank you, Hillary Clinton and Rick Lazio, for being here to the, today. The election, of course, is November 7th. Good luck to both of you. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you and very much. And thanks for being you, here. Thank you. This thanks, is Gabe Rick. Pressman. Good nice evening. <laughs>